If Beale Street Could Talk, If Beale Street Could Talk by James Baldwin. We're starting on page 12. And I didn't see Fanny for a couple of days. I was sure he had the lockjaw and was dying. And Geneva said that just as soon as he was dead, which would be any minute, the police would come and put me in the electric chair. I watched the tailor shop, but everything seemed normal. Mr. Hunt was there with his laughing, light brown self, pressing pants and telling jokes to whoever was in the shop. There was always someone in the shop. And every once in a while, Mrs. Hunt would come by. She was a sanctified woman who didn't smile much. But still, neither of them acted as if their son was dying. So when I hadn't seen Fanny for a couple of days, I waited until the tailor shop seemed empty when Mr. Hunt was in there by himself and I went over there. Mr. Hunt knew me then a little like we all knew each other on the block. Hey, Tish, he said, how are you doing? How's the family? I said, just fine, Mr. Hunt. I wanted to say, how's your family? Which I always did say and had planned to say, but I couldn't. How are you doing in school? He asked me after a minute, and I thought he looked at me in a real strange way. Oh, all right, I said, with my heart, and my heart started beating like I was going to jump out of my chest. Mr. Hunt pressed down that sort of double ironing board they have in the tailor shops, like two ironing boards facing each other. He pressed that down and he looked at me for a minute, and then he laughed and said, Reckon that big-headed boy of mine be back here pretty soon. I had heard what he said, and I understood something, but I didn't know what it was I understood. I walked to the door of the shop, making like I was going out, and then I turned and I said, What's that, Mr. Hunt? Mr. Hunt was still smiling. He pulled the presser down and turned over the pants, or whatever it was he had in there, and said, Fanny. His mama sent him down to her folks in the country for a little while. Claim he get into too much trouble up here. He pressed the presser down again. She don't know what kind of trouble he liked to get in down there. Then he looked up at me and he smiled. When I got to know Fanny and I got to know Mr. Hunt better, I realized that Fanny has his smile. Oh, I'll tell him you come by he said. I said, say hello to the family for me, Mr. Hunt, and I ran across the street. Geneva was on my stoop, and she told me I looked like a fool that I almost got run over. I stopped and said, you a liar, Geneva, Braithwaite. Fonny ain't got the lockjaw, and he ain't going to die, and I ain't going to jail. Now you just go and ask his daddy. And then Geneva gave me such a funny look that I ran. My, up my stoop, up the stairs, and sat down on the fire escape. But sort of in the window where she couldn't see me. Fanny came back about four or five days later, and he came over to my stoop. He didn't have a scar on him. He had two donuts. He sat down on my stoop. He said, I'm sorry I spit in your face. And he gave me one of the donuts. I said, I'm sorry I hit you. And then we didn't say anything. He ate his donut and I ate mine. People don't, <clears throat> people don't believe it about boys and girls that age. People don't believe much. And I'm beginning to know why. But then... We got to be friends, or maybe, and it's really the same thing, something else people don't want to know. I got to be his little sister, and he got to be my big brother. He didn't like his sisters, and I didn't have any brothers, and so we got to be, for each other, what the other missed. 
Geneva got mad at me, and she stopped being my friend. Though, now maybe, maybe now that I think about it, without even knowing it, I stopped being her friend. Because now, and without knowing what that meant, I had Fonny. Daniel got mad at Fonny. He called him a sissy for fooling around with girls. And he stopped being Fonny's friend for a long time. They even had a fight and Fonny lost another tooth. I think that anyone watching Fonny then was sure that he'd grow up without a single tooth in his head. I remember t- telling Fonny that I'd get my mother's scissors from upstairs and go and kill Daniel. But Fonny said I wasn't nothing but a girl and didn't have nothing to do with it. Fonny had to go to church on Sundays, and I mean he had to go. Though he managed to outwit his mother, more often than she knew, or cared to know, his mother, I got to know her better too, later on, and we're going to talk about her in a minute, was, as I've said, a a sanctified woman, and if she couldn't have her husband, she was damn sure going to have her child, because it was her child. It wasn't their child. I think that's why Fani was so bad, and I think that's why he was, when you got to know him, so nice. A really nice person, a really sweet man, with something very sad in him. When you got to know him, Mr. Hunt, Frank, didn't try to claim him, but he loved him, loves him. The two older sisters weren't sanctified exactly, but they might as well have been, and they certainly took after their mother. So that left just Frank and Fonny. In a way, Frank had Fonny all week long. Fonny had Frank all week long. They both knew this, and that was why Frank could give Fonny to his mother on Sundays. What Fonny was doing in the street was just exactly what Frank was doing in the tailor shop and in the house. He was being bad. That's why he he hold on to that tailor shop as long as he could. That's why when Fonny came home bleeding, Frank could tend to him. That's why they could, both the father and the son, love me. That's not really a mystery, except it's always a mystery about people. I used to wonder later if Fonny's mother and father ever made love together. I asked Fonny, and Fonny said, Yeah, but not like you and me. I used to hear them. She'd come home from church, ringing wet and funky. She'd act like she was so tired she could hardly move, and she'd just fall across the bed with her clothes on. She'd maybe had enough strength to take off her shoes and her hat, and she'd always lay her handbag down someplace. I can still hear the sound, like something heavy with silver inside it, dropping heavy wherever she laid it down. I'd hear her say, The Lord sure blessed my soul this evening. Honey, when you going to give your life to the Lord? And baby, he'd say, And I swear to you, he was lying there with his dick getting hard, and excuse me, baby, but her condition weren't no better, because this, you dig, was like the game you hear two alley cats playing in the alley. Shoot, she going to whelp and meow till times get better. She going to get that cat. She going to run him all over the alley, and she going to run him till he bite her by the neck. By this time, he just want to get some sleep, really. But she got her chorus going. He's got to stop the music and ain't but one way to do it. He going to bite her by the neck and then he, she got him. So my daddy just lay there. Didn't have no clothes on. With his dick getting harder and harder. And my daddy would say, about the time I reckon, that the Lord gives his life to me. And she'd say, oh, Frank, let me bring you to the Lord. And he'd say, shoot, woman, I'm going to bring the Lord to you. I'm the Lord. And she'd start crying and she'd moan, Lord, help this man. You give him to me. I can't do nothing about it. 
oh, Lord, help me, and he'd lay. He'd say, the Lord's going to help you, sugar, just as soon as you get to be a little child again, naked like a little child. Come on, come to the Lord. And she'd start to crying and calling on Jesus while he started taking all her clothes off. I could hear them kind of rustling and whistling and tearing and falling to the floor. And sometimes I get my foot caught in one of them things when I was coming through their room in the morning on my way back to way to school. And when he got her naked and got on top of her and she was crying, Jesus, help me. Lord, my daddy would say, you got the Lord now right here. Where you want your blessing? Where where do it hurt? Where you want the Lord's hand to touch you? Here, here, or here? Where you want his tongue? Where you want the Lord? And then they spent some time kissing, and she still belonged to Jesus, and then he went off down the street to the shop. And then Fonny said, hadn't been for me, I believe the cat would have spit, split the scene. I'll always love my daddy because he didn't leave me. I'll always remember Fonny's face when he talked about his daddy. Then Fonny would turn to me and take me in his arms and laugh and say, you remind me a lot of my mother, you know that? Come on now, and let's sing together. Sinner, do you love my Lord? And if I don't hear no moaning, I'll know you ain't been saved. I guess it can't be too often that two people can laugh and make love too. Make love because they're laughing. Laugh because they're making love. The love and the laughter come from the same place. But not many people go there. Fanny asked me one Saturday if I could come to church with him in the morning. And I said yes. Though we, 